All right, it's the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Transform. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host, the cat herder and organizer of this event, and I'm delighted to see you all here. I'm really looking forward to a conversation with one of my favorite people in the field of education and technology. Now, let me welcome this week's guest. I'm delighted to bring Will Richardson on board. Uh, Will is a fantastic person. Uh, among other things, he was the fourth ever guest on the Future Trends Forum. So it's wonderful to see him back here again. Uh, he's one of the most powerful um, uh, people who works, I think, on the future of education. He's been doing some tremendous work uh, with K through 12 in New Jersey. He started several different enterprises, I believe several companies, written a stack of books, consulting and speaking widely. Again, just somebody I really, really respect. I'm delighted that he can make it here. Hello, Will. Welcome. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's great to be back, and thank you for that great introduction. I'm just going to take the the video of that and just uh, <laughs> just send it out to people because that sounds way more impressive than my reality. But thanks for that. Appreciate it. We'll we'll record this and make it available. So don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, I, I have two questions to ask in order to introduce you. Um, and, and you have such a career that there's so many things. I just want to begin with two very, very gentle ones. The first is, where are you today? So I'm at home, actually, in uh, central New Jersey, where it's about uh, 21 degrees outside. It's pretty cold. Um, but yeah, and I uh, just picked up my daughter from the airport. So we're having Christmas here this year. Right. And uh, really looking forward to that. Well, going was that Newark? Yeah, I went to Newark, which was crazed at seven o'clock this morning. She came in on a red eye from LA, but um, thankfully she wasn't going out because it had to be at least a couple hours in line. This is, this is setting you up for kind of Dantean transition from the uh, inferno <laughs> of, of Newark to the uh, hopefully the paradise of, of yeah. Um, the, well, I'm glad that you're home, and as is your daughter. My, my second question is. Looking ahead to 2020, what are the big projects and ideas that you're going to be working on? Well, it's interesting. I think uh, there's uh, obviously a lot of work to be done, a lot of conversations to be had. Uh, I'm actually becoming more and more interested in, in uh, doing events like this and uh, also doing smaller group events um, around, uh, well, we're, we're doing one that I found, I think is really interesting called the Big Questions Institute. That's kind of where my head is. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm filled with many, many different questions about where things are headed. And uh, it's a it's a, an attempt to engage people in asking, first of all, bigger questions, because I think sometimes in our conversations around education, we, uh, we ask some small questions. We ask a lot of how questions when I think basically we should be moving uh, into a lot more of the why. Um, obviously, that's not new. A lot of people are, are uh, singing that song. But um, yeah, and, and just trying again to, to build people's capacity to engage in this conversation at a, I think, a higher level with, with a greater capacity to understand how things are changing in the world and what that means for us in education, specifically in K through 12, right? And let me just say at the beginning that I can't tell you how much I appreciate your work in terms of helping me understand the, both the challenges and opportunities that are happening in higher ed. Um, I think that uh, obviously the two are connected very closely, but yet separate in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. And so it's a it's such an important context for people to have. Um, and it goes the other way, too. Right. I mean, you can't you can't uh, simply live in the world of higher ed without understanding some of the, the challenges and opportunities of K through 12 as well. So. Um, you know, I like to say it's a really interesting time. There's never been a better time to be a learner, but it's also probably one of the most challenging times ever to be an educator. And um, so that's kind of where we're at, and that's going to be the conversation in 2020, I'm sure. Is this the uh, the big questions lab on uh, on modernlearners.com? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And uh, we're uh, putting some new dates together, hopefully around the country, maybe in some places internationally as well. I, 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 uh, I'm doing them with a good friend of mine, Homa Tavanger. Mm -hmm. who uh, is uh, uh, someone who is very much in the conversation around global competencies, equity, mm -hmm. um, all of those types of uh, uh, conversations that are much needed in a world that's expanding and being connected at the rate that it is today. So uh, I'm learning a lot, and that's always the best part of doing that stuff, right, is that uh, I get to learn as much as hopefully the people that we're with. 
That's one of the great secret powers of education. It right? is, yep. Um, and let me uh, welcome folks who've just come in, like Randall, Ed, Giselle, Roxanne, George, Catherine, and Ruben, and Jessica, and Roberta. A whole pile of people just came in. Hello, Heidi. Um, good to see all of you. Um, well, that sounds like fantastic work, and uh, I, I would love to learn more about these uh, these events. Um, we have um, so much to talk about, and 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 the theme that that we chose to anchor today's conversation is changing stories about education, changing stories about school. And I'm wondering, can, can you kick us off? What are some of these stories that you see changing, and, and what do they tell us about the future of education and learning? Well, it's interesting, right? Because as many ways as you uh, you can find new stories coming out of classrooms and coming out of some schools, I'm not sure that the larger story is changing very much at all. Um, I remember uh, there was a Pew report. Actually, I was thinking about this the other day. I think there was a Pew. You may have even been a part of it in terms of... Uh, uh, they interviewed a group of, of experts, educators, trying to look into the future. And I remember Justin Reich from uh, Harvard uh, kind of surprised me when he said, I think the question was, what is education? How, how is it going to change 15, 20 years down the road? And he said he didn't think it was going to change at all 15 or 20 years down the road. Wow. Um, and um, I think in a lot of ways, he might be right that the the Ooh. uber narrative that we have, the the story that we tell about school is a very, very difficult one to change because so much of our society is dependent on that story, right? I mean, structurally, uh, the idea that we're, you know, the, the idea that school isn't going to be compulsory is just something that's just a throwaway. That's not going to happen anytime soon, if ever. Okay. Um, the idea that, you know, they're going to, the kids are going to go appreciably longer than 180 days or six hours a day. So a lot of that stuff is just so woven into our fabric, the way that we conduct ourselves at work, you know, the way that we think about so many of the structures that we have in society are really built around, in many cases, the way school operates. Mm. So the big narrative, I'm not sure the, the, the systems and structures narrative is really going to change that much. But what's interesting is that I think there is a, ch a shift in a, a pretty big shift, actually, in what the expectations of school are. Um, I think there are a lot of people, a lot of parents who I've talked to in recent years who are questioning uh, whether or not school as we know it is preparing kids for the world that they're going to enter. I think everyone feels a little more uncertainty and anxiety and, and you know, looking into the future, what it's going to take for kids to be quote unquote successful, depending on how you define that, right? And that's another part of the story that we we have to interrogate in terms of, you know, what is success in moving into the future? And how is it different from the success that we've defined uh, in the past? I think it's probably really different. Um, so, um, and, and there are a lot of people now who are pushing back against some of the pieces of the story that have been ingrained for a long, long time. The one most interesting to me right now is is the pushback against grades. I, I think it's been fascinating to watch um, Mastery.org, uh, that group of schools that has gotten together and just said, we're not doing this any longer. Grades are really stupid. Um, they don't really measure learning. They don't really give us a sense of whether or not kids will be successful in the future. They put a high degree of anxiety and stress on our children. And so we're not going to do them anymore. And these are very reputable, high flying schools, both independent and public, who have just taken that on and said, we're going to stop that stupidity and have become, I, I think, are on the cusp of being pretty successful in moving to a competency based type of approach that um, you know, higher education is going to is going to get a totally different type of transcript um, without uh, without any numbers on it. Just just, you know, it, it, it's an interesting uh, uh, attempt to reframe the experience of school, that kids don't get grades, that kids don't get numbers, that that colleges don't need numbers, um, that they don't uh, that they that they can actually uh, evaluate what students can do and and their ability to you know to succeed in college based on on competencies and things like that. So 
Um, that's been really interesting. And, and I do think that, that if that domino fell, that a lot of other things might actually um, begin to change um, okay. in terms of how we think about it, you know? What else would fall with them? Well, you know, I mean, so the whole idea of subjects is kind of arbitrary that we that we parcel up learning into 90 minutes or 45 minutes for chemistry and then 45 minutes for English and then, you know, whatever it is. I mean, there are a lot of I call these things the unpleasant truths, right, about school that not a lot of people really want to acknowledge. Um, but we do a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense. Like that doesn't make a lot of sense at the end of the day. Uh, yeah. That's not that's not conducive to learning uh, in the way that we think about learning in our personal lives. We would never do that on our own. That's a construct that we put into schools that at the end of the day doesn't really serve kids. Um, mm -hmm. But yet we continue to do it because that's kind of the way the structure is built. Yeah. I think the teaching changes pretty dramatically in a world where um, if the focus is on projects and if the focus is on, um, you know, doing real work for real purposes in schools, which a lot of schools now are beginning to do, um, you know, another another change that I've seen, and it hasn't been a huge change, but a lot of schools are doing genius hour and they are acknowledging that um, kids need to have time to pursue things that they of their own choosing. They need that agency that that's a good thing for learning, that that inspires them, that their curiosity is piqued when they do that. Um, what is Genius Hour? Go ahead. What is Genius Hour? So Genius Hour basically is giving kids, usually it's an hour a week, although I have seen some schools that are doing, in fact, I'm going to visit a school in Australia in a few weeks um, that's doing it an hour and a half a day where actually um, kids get to choose projects um, and they get to pursue those projects with the help of teachers. So it reframes basically the role of the teacher, which is not to decide what content to be delivered at what time and what, you know, in what fashion, but to support kids, to help them answer the questions, to develop the skills that they need in the moment that they need them. And so teachers become, I guess, coaches or consultants, whatever, however you want to frame that, but it changes the role of the teacher in some pretty interesting ways. And the, just briefly, the interesting thing about Genius Hour, whenever I talk to teachers in K2, K-12 who are doing it, every one of them raves. Every single one of them will tell you that it's some of the best learning that kids do. It's some of the most, they're, they're more engaged, more excited. And so, you know, my kind of throwaway laugh line is, if it's so wonderful, then why don't you just have curriculum hour and make the rest of it genius, right? Because wow. it would seem that would be a better environment for learning. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there are some some pressures that are beginning to bear on this, you know, eight to three, um, you know, whatever it is, six and a half hours a day, six different classes, you know, um, GPA, valedictorian, all that kind of stuff. I think a lot of those things are now people are beginning to look at them and hold them up and say, is this really the experience that we want kids to have? in order to to try to best prepare them for a world that is not very you know doesn't seem at least to be very consistent or not consistent but um predictable let's say or less predictable um and uh you know certainly again just going back to your blog i mean you could riff off the last five things that you've been talking about in terms of you know numbers in higher ed are declining even i, I found it so fascinating that uh, that post you wrote a couple of days ago about um, how people feel about higher education, you mm -hmm. know, that that it, with uh, I guess it's Generation Z, there's like a 30 point drop in six years of people who say that higher ed is very important. Um, and I, I think that's trickling down. I think that that's becoming a, a, a part of how parents are beginning to think about the futures of their kids, not at scale yet. And there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of, again, engaging people in that conversation. But um, I'm finding it a, a little bit more interesting these days in terms of how people are thinking and talking about what they want to pursue in the future. So we seem to be in the cusp of all kinds of changes, um, potentially. Let me, uh, let me bring up um, another, uh, another participant uh, to ask a question about this. Uh, let me bring up Tom Hames from Texas, uh, who had a, a great question. And I want to, if you're new, by the way, to the forum, this is just how easy it is to bring someone up on stage for video. Um, you might not be as cool looking as Tom, but <laughs> um, 
But uh, but on the other hand, you might have a beard, so that might you know. Make some more. <laughs> um, Tom, you had a question about different nations and uh, and this kind of practice. Yeah. So yeah, it, and in you know, just so I have a sophomore in college right now who I was just on the phone trying to help him come up with some thesis statements for a couple of essays <laughs> that he's got to write, and then I also just for full disclosure have a 22 year old daughter who is pretty much self sufficient in Los Angeles with no college degree. So there you go, right? So I, I'm talking about different stories. I mean, I'm living different stories too in terms of my kids. Yeah. So um, it's it's in terms of the international piece of it, there are a couple places that I think are, are more progressive than others. I would say the most progressive thinking around education right now might be British Columbia um, in terms of K through 12 education. Um, they have really, really pulled back on uh, testing and on those types of evaluations. They are um, building much more opportunities for student agency into the school day. Um, and they're, I think, at least creating, attempting to create a culture, which, you know, kind of is the overlap for all of this in terms of when we talk about how the, the story changes. Um, they're trying to build more cultures within their schools that suggest that teachers and students both have more agency to pursue learning on their own terms. Um, and and it's a it's pretty much of a pushback against a lot of those uncommon sense things that that we do in schools where they just um, come to the conclusion that the the narrative needs to shift. Uh, New Zealand is another country where they've always been kind of edgy and thinking differently. Um, and there are other you know other spots. Singapore actually is okay. it, even though even though that's that's a it's still a very kind of test centric and achievement centric um, small country, obviously, um, they're having some very interesting conversations as well about how to do it differently. And uh, so there are some places around the world that that are beginning to to uh, at least have some some different again, ask some different questions. Some have gotten to the point of policy like British Columbia. Um, and and uh, New Zealand and some others. But um, by and large, I think most of the innovation and change is happening in individual classrooms, in individual schools, uh, or it's happening in people who are going outside of the system, which um, I think is beginning to happen a little bit more and more these days. I'm seeing more examples of innovative schools that are starting from the ground up. And you know, in the in the with the people who we work with, I mean, most of my work with, is with leadership in K through 12. And when there are conversations about doing things really differently, um, we always at some point come to the conclusion that it is easier to start something brand new um, that fits a model that you want to pursue than it is to change the old model. Um, changing a school that's been around for a long, long time is excruciatingly difficult. And and in the long run, to be honest with you, um, I, I, I'm a huge uh, fan of Seymour Papert, who wrote extensively about technology and change in kids and schools. And one of his uh, one of his beliefs was basically that the system itself has an autoimmune response to change, <laughs> which I love that line. Right. And so it remains to be seen how uh, to the extent to which real innovation can take root anywhere um, because there's lots of places, lots of individual programs in schools that I'll go visit and I'll say, wow, that's really amazing and come back five years later. And it's not so amazing anymore because it's been kind of, it's been kind of neutered or it's become, you know, there's been a change in leadership or whatever, right? You know how that goes. So, um, and it's really, really hard to be out there on a limb on your own, you know, as much as, as, as much as there may be rhetoric that suggests, well, we need to innovate, we need to try new things, we need to do all this other stuff. At the end of the day, um, really, the experience of school is driven more by the consumer of education and their expectations than it is by the educators. And that's one of the realizations that I've come to in the last two or three years that's kind of disturbing, to be honest with you, but um, is then a, a little bit of a different challenge. Um, is that, again, you know, schools serve a particular purpose in this society that people expect. Yeah. Um, and then to, to change that purpose or to change that experience is to go against society's expectations. And that's really hard to do without some larger 
you know, federal um, type of, of initiative that says, you know, we're going to change things or without higher education coming out en masse and saying, we're not going to do this. We're not going to look at kids the same way we've been looking at them for the last 200 years in terms of who we accept or who we don't accept. Um, and, uh, and, and again, to be honest, if we really were truthful about the experience of school, and I think, you know, you'd probably agree, Tom, if you have three kids in high school, I mean, my question is always to parents, well, what are they learning actually? What are they actually learning in school? And the response is very rarely has anything to do with what's happening in classrooms. What they're learning how to do is succeed at school. Right which is a signal to higher ed that those kids can succeed in school. And so they'll probably succeed in college. And, you know, then we get to the Brian Kaplan argument that high that higher ed is basically a signal more than anything else to employers that kids can do college. So therefore they have the, the, you know, the skills or the um, dispositions or the literacies, whatever else to, to manage that. And they will be, they'll be able to manage a career in some, in some, uh, in something. So, just to kind of tie a bow on that, I mean, you know, my, my son is in a top 50 university in the United States by just about every ranking, and he's there as a, as a scholarship athlete. Um, but basically, he's, what he's really learning is how to, how to get through college, um, you know, and, and um, there's some merit in that. Don't get me wrong, right? He's learning some skills that will serve him probably pretty well in his life. But I think the the idea that, you know, it's the content and the the things he's being tested on and all that kind of stuff, that's a little bit more of a difficult argument to make. I'm not saying that, that higher education is worthless or what happens in classrooms isn't isn't doesn't have some value. But I don't think it has as much value as as uh, we want to pretend that it does, honestly. And um, I do think that uh uh, we're at a moment in in our history right now where we have to interrogate whether or not the experience of getting through school is enough to serve kids in getting through life, which is, I think, changing in some pretty dramatic ways. So, well, ask your kids and ask ask your kids next year what they remember from learning last year. And, and almost 100 percent of the people who I ask that question to will answer it the same way as you do. Yet we don't we don't use that lens then to engage in a really difficult conversation about, well, then what should classrooms be? If it, and, 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 you know, let's be honest, if they're not going to be about learning, well, then let's just say that, okay? Look, the school experience is to get through school and to learn some skills and that kind of thing, but it's really not about learning chemistry, and it's really not about learning history, and it's really not about learning Spanish, because, you know, the way that we learn those things, anything like that, is to be immersed in those things. We learn almost everything that we learn as adults, we learn on the job. Um, certainly there's reading, writing, communication skills, literacies that we need to get from school that school can help us with. I'm not suggesting that it's, t again, it's totally valueless, but um, we do pretend or we do kind of, you know, not not go there very often and say, yeah, you know what, that chemistry class or algebra class, you know, fill in the blank, whatever you want. Yeah, kids aren't learning, really learning very much in there. No, but I, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I don't think it's the students as much as the parents. I, I think the parents expect the same type of experience that they had. Right. Um, that's what they want. They, that's what makes them comfortable. Um, anything that, that goes outside of that experience makes them very uneasy. There's a, there's, a great, there's a great movie, I don't know if you've seen it, but you know, Most Likely to Succeed, which yeah. talks about high tech high. And there's a scene in there where this parent is being interviewed and she goes, I'm really scared because this is not what I did. You know, all this project based stuff that they're doing, all these exhibitions and things that wasn't my experience. I just don't know if this is OK for my kid. That's that's where the narrative has to change. I think um, at, at the end of the day, parents are going to have to demand something different before something really different um, manifests itself in the K through 12 system, at least. Tom, thank you so much for these great questions. And uh, thank you as well for sharing from your own experience. Um, much obliged, much appreciated. Well, uh, so thanks for the softball. Um, <laughs> look, just a couple things, right? So, I, and I think they're they're interrelated. The technology piece is really interesting because in most schools, 98% of the ways that schools use technology is to teach, not to learn. Um, and I think there's a huge distinction there, right? To me, technology is an opportunity to give learners more agency. 
and to allow them to really create and make things and and um, you know do things that they couldn't do without the technology. Too much of of how teachers use it is to you know post documents or or assignments or hand in homework or whatever else. I, again, my kids through eight years of high school, each of them had a laptop um, the entire time. Very little interesting use of technology. So number one, I think that we have to we have to be willing to change the way that we just think about how how learning happens in classrooms to begin with, that it has to be more about student agency. It has to be more about um, giving kids more opportunities to pursue learning on their own terms. That's kind of the phrase that I've I've become a little fond of, maybe too fond of. But anyway, um, where to start? Well, we always start with the most important question in the work, and that is, well, how do you define learning? What is it? Um, And and it's it's kind of uh, shocking how difficult the question that is for educators to answer. Um, it's not one that many people actually talk about very much. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, uh, it's one that when you really get down to it, uh, when you really check in to your own personal experience around learning, when you really try to um, define it or describe it in ways that, um, that match again, the way you understand it in your own life, it looks very different from what we do in classrooms. Um, because, you know, good, really powerful learning requires agency. It requires time. It requires passion and curiosity. It requires um, creating things and, and you know, all that type of stuff. And then uh, if you can get to that point and then just map that to the experience that kids are having in school, that's a great place to start the conversation. Because more often than not, those two things are totally in dissonance, right? Um, what you believe is not what you do uh, in most cases in schools. And, wow. and a lot of that, again, is, is uh, structural. A lot of that is cultural. A lot of that is just tradition, whatever else. But if, if you're not starting from that frame, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that, that anything sticks in terms of innovation or change. So, Wow. Well, if the question is, um, can we change the learning experience given the structures of current schools that we have, it's difficult. It's really hard. You know, I mean, we're, we're putting kids in the spaces that comfortably hold maybe 20, 25 kids. Um, they're isolated from other classrooms, usually, um, you know, whatever else. I mean, the structures, the, the, the classroom environments and the structures that we have in schools are not conducive to the type of learning that we would hope kids would experience, again, if we've had those conversations around learning. So you're right. This is a really, I think, uh, interesting moment when it comes to design of schools. And there are there are a lot of people out there who are doing some very, very interesting things. But what I find um, most powerful about it is that most of the innovative designs that I see are really based on a conversation around what learning is and how it happens and what it requires. Mm-hmm. There's a, a great school uh, called Design 39 Campus out in uh, outside of San Diego, um, where they spent a couple of years basically asking the question, you know, what is learning? How does it happen? What does it look like? What's required? They built a beautiful school where the, the uh, classroom environments are um, they're collaborative. They, you know, they have a lot of uh, flexibility, flexible open spaces, all that type of stuff, right? And they, they also, but they also built that to employ a very different narrative, a very different story, or a very different experience of how kids go through school. And so they don't do grades. They don't do. They don't separate kids out by grade as much, you know. And this was basically a K through eight school uh, when they started it. Um, I think they're about five or six years in, just as a side note, they're about five or six years in and parents have come to them now and they've said, you now have to build a high school because we don't want our kids to experience the high school that currently exists after they've had this experience. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and again, design had a lot to do with that um, in terms of, of, of what it looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like, all that kind of stuff. The most innovative place I've ever seen, by the way, is a school outside of Sydney, Australia, which um, is, uh, it was just, 
mind-bogglingly beautiful and in in uh, just innovative and whatever else. But they again started with the conversation: what kinds of environments do kids need to learn most powerfully? What what needs to be present? I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, it's uh, I'll I'll remember it and um, I'll uh, I'll either tweet it out or, or uh, um, thank you. Yeah, I'll remember it, but. But yeah, but so there's a lot of innovation that's happening with school design right now. And, oh, Northern Beaches Christian School. There you go. Northern Beaches Christian School. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a it's a really interesting moment for design as well. But only if it's if it's grounded in a, a, a conversation around well, how does learning really happen? You know, I think you have to throw out. You, you have to start almost with a blank slate, and you start from there. And uh, if you can do that, then I think you can build really interesting spaces. I mean, if you've articulated the definition of learning, that um, is probably the one that all of us would come up with. The 21 of us give us, you know, 20 minutes or so in this forum, we'd come up with probably a fairly similar definition that, you know, learning is when it's your choice, when you have freedom, when, you know, all those types of things, right? If, if you've articulated the definition of learning, which many schools have too right now, they're doing that work. Then, then yeah, your curriculum, the way that you teach should be built on that definition. The people you hire, the budgets that you create, the assessments that you create, you know, everything that you do has to map back to that definition. Otherwise, what's the point? Why, why, would, you, why would you articulate a, a definition of what you believe learning is and then not employ that definition in every decision that you make? And by the way, I, you know, just for the sake of saying it, I guess, but... I, I'm almost, you know, it, it, I'm almost better off or, or happier when schools say, well, we, be learn, we believe that learning, we actually believe that learning happens when kids sit in 60 minute classes in rows, listening to a teacher talk. If that's what you believe, then do that. At least that makes it a consistent experience for kids. They all understand what the game is, what the rules are. Instead of saying to kids, well, we really don't know. And so my kids experienced school. They went to block one, had to figure out what that teacher meant by learning. Then they went to block two. It was a totally different definition. Block three was something totally different again because there's no there's just no cohesiveness or no coherence around what learning means. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, thank you for the great questions, especially based on your experience. Just one quick question for you. Is uh, the third teacher book from Canon Design? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yep. That's it. Hi, Will. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about your, your term student agency quite a lot. Hi, Brian. I hope you're feeling better. Um, I'm thinking about the term student agency because that's thrown a lot around a lot. And it, it's one of those talking points as well. But I want to bring into the conversation now teacher agency. We don't often recognize teachers need to be empowered. And, and what do you think about um, environments that facilitate and cultivate teacher agency? And how do you see this unfolding like in the next five years with innovation and technologies? Well, that happens in college as well, right? Of course, so this comes and the students are saying, okay, what what does my professor want me to do so I can pass it? So it's not only the culture in K through 12, you're talking about college as well. So it's a systemic change from, let's say, preschool through uh, 20. Well, we're, we're almost out of time, but we had two more great questions that came in. Uh, oh, it's okay. Well, let me bring up one from uh, <laughs> from a long-term uh, friend of the program, George Station, terrific guy, who asks, how can our higher ed colleagues, as well as our parents, demand an experience different from their own for today's students? Let me bring it back up. Is there space to do this outside rogue pockets of rebellion? We have a uh, another question from uh, the awesome Giselle. Uh, let me bring it from Giselle LaRose. We ask, have you seen any breakthrough results where a school district or college has approached organizational change by harnessing a common interpretation of learning? The questions are burbling in uh, right as we completely out of time. Uh, April had a question about what kind of schools you want your kids to attend. Uh, Catherine Prince just asked, uh, what will be some characteristics of narratives? Um, let's think about that and maybe uh, maybe take it to Twitter. Um, I, I'm 
I, I, I hate to wrap things up so quickly, but we we are out of time. Um, Will, it's fantastic talking with you. Um, you you're an emissary of, of change and, and new ways of learning. Um, what are the best ways for people to keep up with you? I mean, your Twitter feed, Will Richard um, 45. Now, if you'd like to catch up on Will's first appearance on the forum way back in 2016, or if you'd like to catch up on almost 200 other videos, please just head to tinyworld.com slash FDF archive where you can find them all. If you'd like to keep talking about what is learning and how do we redesign the narratives around schooling, we have a lot of places for you to do that. You can join us on our Facebook group, our LinkedIn group, our Slack channel, or just keep adding at us on Twitter at FTTE. In the meantime, thank you all again for fantastic conversations. For everyone who, support, who celebrates uh, these winter holidays, please have a great one. And otherwise, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.